Testing, uh, testing. I hear somebody has their audio on over there. Yeah. Testing audio for the captions. The meeting will commence shortly. The meeting will commence shortly.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I'm chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Tuesday, January 17th. It is uh, 9.02 a.m. and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'll begin by first introducing my fellow board colleagues. Joining me today is Vice Chair Doreen Diodamo, virtually. Uh, joining us as well here in person is Nicole Morgan, board member Nicole Morgan, board member Sean McGuire, board member Laurel Firestone. And additionally, we have here this morning, Eric Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer our chief uh, uh, executive director. Uh, <laughs> Michael Laufer, our chief counsel, it's the beginning of the year. When you don't do the speech for a while, it can get a little rusty. Our chief deputy this morning with us as well is Jonathan Bishop. Our clerk of the board is Courtney Tyler and assisting her today is Margie Arjol and Biba Malatik. As you can see, this meeting is a hybrid meeting. And so for those of you joining us virtually, you're uh, either viewing us from the Cal EPA uh, live stream or the YouTube live stream. But if you intend on commenting on any items today during the board meeting, you need to be on the Zoom platform. There are instructions on how to do so at the top of the agenda. If you're having any challenges getting onto the Zoom platform though, please do just email the clerk of the board at board.clerk at waterboards.ca.gov and she can help get you onto the platform. Once you are on the platform, your camera will be off, you will be on mute until it's your turn to speak on the item you've indicated. For everyone here in the room, good morning. We're here in Sacramento in the California Environmental Protection Agency building. A uh, few announcements for us as well. Please do observe uh, the exits. If there happens to be an emergency, we'll calmly file out to Cesar Chavez Plaza and await uh, further direction there. Uh, additionally, if you are intending on commenting on today's uh, items, you, there is a QR code uh, on the wall for you to be able to sign up. Uh, once uh, you do come to the podium, please introduce yourself and any affiliation you're a part of. Uh, also, please silence any phones just so that we can have an uninterrupted discussion for today. Uh, with that, we're actually beginning this morning with a large tranche of Superior Accomplishment Awards. I really want to appreciate uh, those that have kind of held on to the new year here. I know we ended the, the new year with quite a schedule, and so I really appreciate everyone's time and patience this morning as we acknowledge those that actually do the work at this institution. It's easy for us as board members up here to opine, take credit, and you know um, also uh, take whatever criticism is out there but it is you all that are the, the heart of this institution. And so we appreciate everyone's patience as we uh, here take a moment to acknowledge a lot of folks that have uh, contributed well here to the boards. And so I would like to welcome up first and foremost, uh, I believe we're starting with uh, the Office of Information uh, Management and Analysis. Uh, and I have Ali Dunn and Tess uh, Fahoud uh, to start us off. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead and call everyone up uh, so you can, you know, even as we uh, introduce them, have them already up here with us. Okay. I'll do a walk so we can look at everybody. All right, well, good morning. Um, I'm going to introduce Michelle Tang. She's an environmental scientist with uh, the Office of Information Management and Analysis, or OEMA. And Michelle has been with our program for a long time. <laughs> and over that, the course of her time within OEMA and Swamp has really kind of actualized the vision of our program in Swamp, which is to make our data accessible and better understood. Um, she does this through some pretty awesome data science magic, and we very lovingly refer to her as our data science unicorn. <laughs> Um, but in that, just taking like 20 years of monitoring data and instead of having it in these static reports that sometimes people don't always read, she creates these super awesome interactive data dashboards that um, are very easy to understand and does a beautiful job at, at telling the story of water quality in California. So with that, thank you, Michelle. It's been an honor working with you and you want to come get your fancy award? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Tessa Fogit, and I am recognizing my staff person, Kim Pham, who has worked in our unit, the, we call it the Swamp IQ unit, but it's our quality assurance and data management unit for Swamp. Um, she's worked here for since 2014, since it began. Um, and I've been, I've had the pleasure of supervising her for the past five years. She is our chemistry data manager and chemistry is our biggest and most complex data type. So she handles the bulk of our data and it's, um, there's so many different types that she has to look at and she reviews it to make sure that it meets our swamp quality standards. And then she also does the fun job of loading it into the database. Um, and over the past two years, Kim has um, had a 68% increase in the number of chemistry files she has managed. And she has, you know, used her amazing organizational skills um, to kind of improve her already efficient process as she was already processing the highest volume of data for us. And she has worked hard um, to work on those process improvements to kind of catch up with her backlog of data and um, reduce that over these past two years. Um, there was a variety of factors that made us have this increase of files. Um, and she's done a great job of working through it. So we're recognizing her for her amazing data abilities. So thanks, Kim. And thank you both as managers for uplifting their work and creating this opportunity to be able to really acknowledge what I know, you know, uh, here shared on the board is a huge priority when it comes to just better utilizing our data to make us better decision makers amongst it. So huge thanks. And we can take a, a quick, uh, our traditional awkward photo here at the dais. <laughs> Next, I have the honor of calling up our, uh, the head of the Office of uh, Research Planning and Performance, James Knockbauer. Yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, today I've got awards for two different people in two different programs, but they're joined in their common sense of purpose and service, uh, in their skill in working with really complex situations, and their skill at integrating many different perspectives while maintaining the rigor of their work. They also always focus on empowering other people. Um, first, we've got Jamie Ferguson. Uh, she has been an exceptional leader in our transition to the Cornerstone Learning Management System. This has been a, a 10-year dream of hers, um, and it's really taken three or four years now to get the contracting, procurement, agreement, customization, integration, uh, rollout, and content all in place. Um, she did this in coordination with Division of Administrative Services, Information Technology, CaliPA, CaliHR, um, other CaliPA organizations, and beyond. Um, and she knew there would be no backstop during this transition. Our, our former system, the uh, Go Sign Me Up learning, uh, learning system, went offline exactly when Cornerstone came online. And I never had any doubt that Jamie and her team would be able to seamlessly uh, pull off a transition. Uh, she's also ensured there was a robust uh, rollout and training process about this training program for employees and management managers. Um, and this has been really helpful for us to bring out uh, a whole bunch of robust trainings and to make signups and approval more, more, um, more manageable and more workable. She's done this all while leading and supporting and challenging her team and helping the training team uh, and other units at the water boards meet ongoing needs and emerging issues, uh, including training topics like leadership, inclusiveness, racial equity, and scientific and technical uh, needs. She's done this also in coordination with, uh, with Davis, with Sac State, um, with CalHR, and many others. So she strongly deserves this recognition today. Come on up, Jamie. <laughs> so
Second, uh, Ms. Crystal Taylor. Um, I want to recognize her today, and so do the leaders in the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, who supported her nomination for her extraordinary efforts in wildfire planning and response activities, which reflect her commitment, her creativity, and her understanding of the science, the parties, and the policies governing non-point source discharges of waste to surface water associated with vegetation management, forest management, and wildfire-related work. Uh, Crystal, you began your uh, work with the Central Valley Water Board in 2020 with the onset of the North Complex fire that burned nearly 320,000 acres, destroyed nearly 2,500 structures, and resulted in 16 fatalities. During and following that emergency, she led a multi-agency watershed task force designed to pool agency technical support, uh, collate water quality data, and inform public outreach efforts. And through this, she gained everyone's trust and confidence, which led to her taking on a similar role in 2021 and 22, leading another task force for the nearly 1 million acre Dixie Fire. At the same time, she's represented the boards in numerous other multi-agency coordination efforts to improve the state's environmental protection plan, which is the policy that, in the absence of certain state permits as authorized under executive orders, ensures that emergency work, such as debris removal and tree removal, is conducted in a manner protective of California's watersheds and other natural resources. And she also furthered the effectiveness of the emergency management program by leading the development of their charter and uh, an annual work plan, which has provided clear organizational structure and led to targeted statewide training efforts, allowing all involved in wildfire efforts to better understand priority projects and program goals. So she also deserves our recognition today. Huge thanks, Jamie and Crystal. And you're not gonna get away without an awkward photo with us here as well. So just really appreciate, uh, those are core issues here within the work that we do, both supporting our staff and of course all the wildfire work. So just huge thanks. Next, we have uh, two uh, safe and affordable uh, funding for equity and resilience uh, program uh, team recognitions. And I believe the first is through Kathy Owen and DIT. Yes, please. So I'm here today to present an award to the DIT team for the Safer Cloud Migration Project. This project was essential to serve the increased demand for new drought functionality and drought preparedness initiatives as outlined by Senate Bill 55. The Safer Cloud Migration Project was complex and highly technical. The work to make this project successful included, we got them all now, yay, um, mapping, the on-premise architecture to the Azure cloud services, planning meetings with management and staff, configuration and testing of cutting edge cloud services, communications multiple to staff leading up to the go live date and technical support after the migration. Please join me in, in congratulating the recipients of this award. As I call your name, can you come up please, Hans?
Huge thanks again. The data systems that we use, uh, and especially within SAFER, have been just such a critical part of our success. Being able to actually see communities and the challenges that they have amongst their water systems is why we've been able to, to really push on solutions and see, the, and see the progress that we've had. So, so much, so much thanks to the critical work, often unseen work that you all could do. So just thank you so much. Really appreciate everyone. Next, I'd like to be able to call up, still in the, uh, I think, vein of safer here, Andrew Altavote. Thank you, Chair Escobar, members of the board. So today, I actually have two additional safer awards. I'm going to a, a large team that uh, has been working again on the safer data, and I'll invite the folks who are in the room to come on up while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, the first award is actually one for work that was done over a year and a half ago on the SAFER dashboard, and that's our outward public-facing uh, visualization tool that we have that presents the data on the um, failing and at-risk systems for SAFER. It allows you to look at statewide. Um, it also allows you to drill down in various ways and look at the data, look at individual systems and their risk factors, et cetera. And that took a team of folks from uh, Division of Drinking Water, Division of uh, Information Technology, OEMA, and Division of Financial Assistance all coming together. There's about, I think, 15 people working on that to make that happen. And it's something that I think the board members are familiar with that tool. And you know, we we the other uh, in December actually, the tool went down for a couple of days. We had a couple of technical issues, and we got a bunch of calls and, and emails about it. So I think it's something that really is being um, utilized a lot. We really appreciate that. And then the um, the second award is for our team um, from DIT and DDW who um, were responsible for putting safer data up on the, um, the open data portal, the California open data, data portal, and actually automating that. And so we, we believe it was actually the first time uh, that a state agency had a fully automated process for taking the data from, um, from our safer systems and putting them up there. So if you go to that data set, it's always up to date and it's done without any additional staff involvement or anything. So um, I just wanted to congratulate the group. We have a number of them here, a number who couldn't make it who are online, but um, thank you. <clears throat> Huge thanks to you as well, Andrew, for, for elevating again and acknowledging their work and completely agree that the dashboard has become such a critical part of the way that we think about our systems within the state, the way that we continue to find solutions as well here. Um, and, and great to hear that it's not just uh, ourselves here that are using it. A lot of folks are out there using the data and using it to, to continue to bring solutions. So uh, just huge thanks for the recognition and important, uh, importantly, huge thanks to the team for the actual work. try to be as quick and as expedient on this uh, photo as we can. So thanks everyone for the patience.
Again, thanks everyone for this this time to do this. And we have one uh, one additional tranche, I think, of folks uh, to acknowledge amongst it. Andrew, is that uh, true, or or did that encompass both? Thank you, Andrew. That wraps up our Superior Accomplishment Awards. Huge thanks again to everyone here. 2023 was an incredible year, and I know here as we begin this year, uh, the board's work, uh, it, will, it will be another big year for it. So just appreciate everyone's continued contributions to uh, what is no small mission before us. Um, and huge thanks here from the dais. That now brings us to public forum. And I believe we have one public uh, forum commenter. Uh, we have Alton Wright, I believe joining us here virtually. Um, good morning, directors. Alton Wright, former director at North Yuba Water District. I believe the board clerk included my short memo in today's meeting record. I hope you've had a moment to review it. If not, that's okay. I'm not here to reread my memo. Rather, I have a single relevant question, though I'm not expecting an answer today. Instead, I hope my question inspires the board to consider the integrity and honesty of those entrusted with managing and supplying one of California's most precious resources. My question is this, is the access, conveyance, and sale of unpermitted water allowed by the State Water Resources Control Board? Thank you for your time. Thank you as well. I believe that wraps up everyone we have for public forum and appreciate um, everyone, well, or one commenter that uh, took the opportunity to address the board. Uh, next, I'd like to now move on to official board business. And our first item of board business is consideration of adoption of the December 19th board meeting minutes. Are there any adjustments, comments, or motions? I'll make a motion to adopt the um, board, December 19th board meeting minutes. I'll second. Thank you both. Uh, Ms. Tyler, can you please call roll call vote? Board Member Morgan? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the first vote of the year, a successful one. Good tidings for additional ones. And that brings us now to our uncontested items, uh, which are still items uh, two through four. Do we have? Okay, uh, then what we can do, Ms. Dunham, uh, do you mind if we check in with you really quick just to see if you'd like uh, item number four to be pulled from the uncontested items? No need to pull it from the uncontested item. Okay, just really appreciate your participation though. Good morning, Ms. Dunham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, happy new year. Happy new year. We can still take two through four as uncontested unless any board members, and I just want to thank all the good work I know that went into them. And, uh, but if anyone would like to make a motion, I think we are prepared. I'll move to adopt uh, items two, three, and four. I'll second. Thank you both. Ms. Tyler. Board member McGuire. Aye. Board member Morgan. Aye. Board member Firestone. Aye. Vice Chair Diadamo. Aye. And Chair Esquivel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. The votes carry and the items are adopted. Again, appreciate everyone's good work uh, on them. That then brings us uh, into then our informational items. And our first item is our current hydrologic conditions and response update. We'll give a moment to transition to the item. Good morning, Good morning. Chair and members. I'm James Nachbauer, the Director of the Office of Research, Planning, and Performance, and we coordinate these 
hydrologic condition and response updates. Um, my colleague who is doing the monthly conservation and water use reporting is I think, on her way down. So maybe we will begin with our water rights update. Good morning. I'm Jessica Bean with the Division of Water Rights. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so it's been a little while since we've done, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> It's been a little while since we've done one of the uh, fuller hydrologic updates. So I'll show you a few slides, remind you of what we're looking at, and then also just a few things to kick off what we had in December as we as we headed into January of this year. Um, so what you're looking at here is uh, is a graph from uh, from NOAA. It's their um, sorry, uh, it is the average temperature ranking for December of 2023. And the darker colors here, that kind of darker red is really showing where we have the warmest temperatures and then blue would be the coldest. And as you can see, no blue on that map. So pretty warm for the entire um, state. And it's worth noting that it was the warmest December on record globally. Um, also, uh, a the warmest across much of the northern US. And then if you see that dark red blob in California, that's really showing where it was the warmest in the San Joaquin Valley and the Central Coast. And then really for the rest of California, it was um, you know, above average in terms of temperature. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we, as we move forward. Next slide, please. Another uh, graph that, that is kind of interesting, a little hard to see on, on the slide here, but essentially you're looking at your water, your precip uh, precipitation percent of normal through about January 15th. So this has shifted slightly with the recent storms that we had, but it's still pretty accurate where your darker colors, the kind of reddish brown is extremely below normal. And then as you go into reds and oranges, you're getting you know much more below normal or just below. Again, a lot of those darker oranges and red colors and so with the recent storms, um, they've helped with the deficit, but again, much of the state is still below average in terms of precipitation. Next slide, please. So we'll go into our traditional slides now that you're, you're used to seeing, but essentially what you have here is um, looking at the different indexes for precipitation um, and your lighter blue area is the average. And then if you look down around January on the graph here, you can see that blue line is the current where we are. And so for the northern part of the state, we're looking at um, about 66% of average. It's, it's ticked up. I think it's actually 67% today. Next slide, please. And for uh, the San Joaquin area, we're looking at 47% today. Again, these numbers are slightly different because these graphs were pulled yesterday, but I went ahead and looked to see what they were, if they had changed today. And then if you go to the next slide, for the Thule Basin area, we are at one at 41%. So, you know, more precipitation in the northern part of the state, less the further we go south. Next slide, please. So here's um, our state, excuse me, our snowpack. And if we look statewide, we are below average. Um, again, this slide was taken on January 11th. So the storms that happened over the weekend um, and then what we saw yesterday have changed these a little bit. So I will give you some more updated numbers for that as well. But essentially you can, you can see that average is in blue again. And um, the, the dark blue line is where we are currently. So for the um, statewide, we're 49% of normal for this time of year. And then in the north, we're at uh, 54%. As you get into the central area, 53%, and then 32% south. So again, it's not even in terms of the snowpack that we're seeing. Um, we do have some more storms slated, which is great. I will say it's getting warmer. So they're gonna be warmer snow, that, uh, excuse me, warmer storms. So we're anticipating seeing some rain. Um, the snow is gonna be at much higher elevations. So not sure how that's gonna impact the snowpack, but we'll just keep an eye on it. Next slide, please. Okay, here's our major reservoirs. Um, and just to note that that here again, um, you haven't seen this in a while, but uh, the little the little charts are for the each of the major reservoirs. Your um, kind of goldenrod box shows the capacity. Uh, the green line there is the historical average and the blue is, is current capacity. And so on the positive side, we have um, <clears throat> 
excuse me, all of our major reservoirs are close to or um, above average. And just to note, it's um, the Pine Flat Reservoir is the highest at 166% of normal. And then um, the San Luis is the uh, lowest one at about 86%. And you can see here, when we um, look at the select south of Delta reservoirs, um, the capacity for Kachuma is 91%, Diamond Valley is 93%, and um, San Luis is 59% of capacity. Next slide, please. So um, we wanted to provide some of an update on where we are with groundwater uh, recharge temporary permits. Um, you know, that's obviously been a big discussion topic. And just to note, we've received nine permits to date, and we have uh, been able to authorize four um, for the water year. And that authorizes about 30,000 acre feet of diversions. And just to note, the most recent one was uh, for the South Sutter Water District. They have that 180 day temporary permit. And um, so we have the other ones are pending for a variety of reasons. We do have a website where folks can check in to see the status of those. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, we don't have any flood recharge diversions reported. Uh, understandably, <laughs> we haven't had any really to divert, but it's worth noting that um, Flood recharge is very important, but uh, we're not going to recharge our way out of groundwater management and accountability. So we just want to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, because we have these increasingly volatile uh, climates and huge swings between wet and dry, you know, just getting prepared for those, capturing them when we can, um, very difficult to wait until really at this point to capture anything that we're going to see. Um, so just pushing for always planning for those in advance. Next slide, please. Okay, gonna transition just slightly and give you a brief update on where we are with the Scott and Shasta River watersheds. And again, you've seen these slides before. You have some green bars showing precipitation for the um, Scott River at the, this is gonna be for the Fort Jones gauge is what the blue line is showing. And then our red dash, dot, excuse me, dashed line is for the emergency minimum flows. If you take a look at that blue line, as you go to the end, you can see the storms were, were captured in there with those peaks. And so um, as of this morning, uh, we were at about 600, excuse me, 768 CFS. And then um, if you go to the next slide, we're looking at the Shasta River, similar slide showing the, um, the blue line in particular, taking a look at that gauge at the Wairika gauge. And you can see again, that peak of uh, the storms that we're showing. And then, uh, so the trend up and in flows and coming back down still above that emergency minimum flows that we had established previously. And this morning that was at 227 CFS. Uh, next slide, please. And then just wanted to give you an update on where we are with the Scott Shasta emergency regulation. Um, we uh, issued the notice of proposed rulemaking on January 12th um, based on uh, the requirements for the Office of Administrative Law, OAL. Um, that noticing period is gonna end on the 22nd and we, and, uh, we anticipate um, January 23rd going into effect, excuse me, uh, sending the rulemaking package to OAL and they have 10 days for review, which would mean, you know, shortly thereafter by the end of, uh, excuse me, the beginning of February, we could probably have the regulation in effect and it will be good for one year. And so then um, folks can stay up to date on that at um, the Water Board's uh, website that's listed on the slide. And that is what I have for you today. I really appreciate that, Ms. Bean. And just a quick recap on, you know, the permits that have been uh, submitted and the that have been issued so far. And uh, to your point, yes, you know, the time for submission is really summer, fall planning period. Um, we're here in the middle of things, but, you know, glad to continue to work with folks if they're looking to come in the door. So appreciate that. Mr. Nuckbauer, or I should say Ms. Kelly. Hello, members of the board. I'm Ava Scali, an environmental scientist with the ORPP Climate and Conservation Team. Can we get the next slide, please? So I'm here filling in for Dr. Rodera today, whose work still made my work possible today, even though she's on leave. And to recap our status on the monthly urban water use reporting, we unfortunately still have delays while working on the transition from our old submission platform on the drink portal to the DDW Data Safer Clearinghouse. Although we expect these transitions to be fully complete very soon. And I will also be posting the full data set of our monthly reporting from May onward online by the end of the month. Uh, next slide, please. 
So our latest month snapshot for urban reporting is October of 2023. Our statewide residential use average was 89 gallons per capita per day. This information is based on 404 reports. There were some outliers of extreme error that were filtered out. As you can see, 2023 was a wetter year than the previous two years, but uh, based on the greener shade, which is hard to see on this slide, on the Palmer Drought Severity Index. The, however, the RGPCD remains the same from 2021, 2022, which is an interesting observation. Next slide, please. This is a month-to-month -month comparison, January to October 2022 versus 2023. January through October 2022 was a very dry year, as we just saw, and it corresponds to higher residential water use. 2023 winter to spring brought lots of rain and sustained cooler conditions throughout the early summer. End of March, Governor Newsom lists several emergency drought proclamations, including the 15% voluntary conservation threshold, but all county drought level emergencies are still in effect. Starting in July, temperatures rise, typical dry season conditions hold, and we see RGPCD catch up to the previous year. And I look forward to providing more information from the 2023 whole calendar year to complete this picture in our next conservation update. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I really do appreciate. I know, you know, as, as we transition to a different portal, there's been some data issues. I appreciate folks continuing to work on those so that we can have a just a continued uh, accurate and and informative uh, data set when it comes to conservation currently in the state as we contemplate uh, we know uh, conservation budgets which are a hot topic amongst folks so thanks for the continued work here to make sure that we have this data and looking forward to um, yeah it's getting uh, here uh, caught up if you will and uh, continue to move forward in a really critical space so much appreciated for that update Looking to our fellow board colleagues, if there are any comments or questions on the informational item, we don't have any commenters that I see here. So I think we're just here on the steam of our own discussion, if we'd like. Seeing none, much appreciated. Thanks for the informational update. Look forward to, I know it will be a year of continued watching the skies and figuring out what it is that we'll have to manage for the year. So thank you. That now then brings us to item number six, which is consideration of a proposed resolution approving an amendment to the water quality control plan for the Central Coast Basin. I would like to call up folks and wait for a moment here as we transition. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm Peter Bonch Osmolowski, Central Coast Water Board Engineering Geologist, and I am here to make the recommendation for the Basin Plan Amendment, total maximum daily loads for nitrogen compounds in the San Inez River Basin. Adoption of this uh, resolution will result in the Basin Plan Amendment to incorporate nitrogen compounds, TMDLs, and an implementation strategy to improve nitrate, ammonia, and total nitrogen water quality for the San Inez River Basin. Oh, next slide, please. So there's the, um, there's the recommendation approving the Basin Plan Amendment. And uh, next slide, please. So to geographically orient you, this is a map of the San Inez River Basin. It's a 900 square mile river basin in Santa Barbara County, which encompasses the communities, communities of Lompoc, Solvang, Buellton. And I've highlighted in red the location of the surface water impairments by nitrogen compounds, which do occur really just in the lowermost reaches of the river basin from around the city of Lompoc downstream to the San Inez River estuary. We currently don't have any actual data for the estuary itself. Elsewhere in the middle and upper reaches of the river basin, we, where we have monitoring data, the, the nitrogen water quality trends are quite good and concentrations are well below water quality standards. Next slide, please. 
So let, let's take a quick look at the nature of the water quality problem this TMDL is addressing. First, we do have the um, elevated nitrogen compounds in surface waters of the lowermost river basin downstream of Lompoc. And um, note that I will be using the word nitrogen as shorthand for nitrogen compounds, which includes nitrate, ammonium, and total nitrogen. We also have some concerns about nutrient loads reaching the San Inez River estuary, which is a, a biologically productive, important resource. Uh, I mentioned we don't currently have data for the estuary, but we do have concerns about potential nitrogen loading to the estuary. Finally, we also want to acknowledge that there have been um, upgrades at the Lompoc Wastewater Treatment Plant about a decade ago, and this has resulted in very significant um, improvements in nitrogen water quality. Next slide, please. So the overarching goal, the water quality goal identified in this TMDL is reduction and management of nitrogen loads from controllable sources. In achieving this goal, there will be a cascade of water quality benefits that will result as illustrated in this schematic. Starting left and moving right on the schematic, reductions in nitrate will improve drinking water quality and reduce risk to human health. Also, we anticipate protection of high quality waters, which means maintaining the existing good water quality where we have it elsewhere in the middle and upper reaches of the river basin. And reductions in nitrogen um, ammonia toxicity will provide um, benefits to aquatic habitat. And finally, we, we anticipate providing an extra level of protection to the estuary to reduce nutrient enrichment, uh, which tend to fuel nuisance algae blooms. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide gets to the meat and potatoes of the TMDL. TMDLs are representations of the loading capacity of a water body uh, to protect against the risk of nitrate and ammonia toxicity and to provide some protection against the risk of biostimulation in the estuary downstream. And that biostimulation is a, is a condition of excessive algae and biomass. The protective water quality thresholds for these goals are 10 milligrams per liter nitrate, 0 0.025 milligrams per liter ammonia, and 8 milligrams per liter total nitrogen, respectively. Total nitrogen includes nitrogen in all its molecular forms, and this does provide some additional measure of protection to the estuary from nutrient enrichment. Next slide, please. Uh, taking a quick glance at the implementation strategy for this TMDL project. Overall, the primary objective is to reduce nitrogen loads from wastewater, fertilizer, stormwater, and animal waste. The primary source happens to be wastewater from the Lompoc treatment plant, and uh, that's, been, that's been the primary source of nitrogen loading to the lower river basin. Uh, a secondary objective is to prevent degradation of higher quality waters where they exist in the river basin. I mentioned that there are many cases where we have very low nitrogen concentrations in parts of the middle and upper reaches of the river, ba river basin. And implementation of this TMDL will leverage existing permits and programs. We're not proposing or recommending any new or additional permits or regulatory measures. Uh, next slide, please. Because we have already seen improving nitrogen water quality in the lower San Inez River, we do not expect it's going to take, uh, take a significant time frame to achieve the water quality goals identified in this TMDL. We anticipate that all nitrogen compound water qualities will be achieved within five years. And in fact, in many cases, they're being achieved right now. So five years is really, a, a, it should be a, a pretty good time frame. Next slide. We did have a public outreach and public comment period for this TMDL. We did, um, we did outreach to um, uh, tribal leaders in accordance with state law. We did CEQA scoping outreach. We had two, um, two public meetings. We engaged with uh, EPA, and we did have a public comment period from January 30th to March 16th. We did, receive, um, we did receive two public comment letters from Santa Barbara Fly Fishers and Heal the Ocean. So, um, Santa Barbara Fly Fishers, uh, their comment was they, they were requesting more stringent nitrogen thresholds or nitrogen targets for the San Inez River estuary. 
and Heal the Ocean primarily, their focus was primarily on um, suggesting that we should really consider groundwater to be a source of nitrate to streams. And we should also consider um, septic systems to be a source of nitrogen loading to surface waters. So those are the comments in the next slide. And so concerning how we responded to those, um, those good comments, um, the, we don't have, with the regard to the estuary, we don't have da uh, water quality data for the estuary. The estuary itself is not listed on the 303D list for impairments, so we're not even, we're not even certain about its, its status with regard to impairment. But as I mentioned, it is an important biological resource. We recognize that, and therefore we um, developed total nitrogen targets for um, the San Inez River, which will provide um, an extra level of protection against nutrient enrichment to the estuary, even though we don't currently know what the status of the estuary is now. We, uh, we can always reopen the TMDL based on new information. So if we have new information for the estuary, we can definitely revisit this TMDL and maybe look at, at different nitrogen thresholds to protect the estuary. Um, with regard to Heal the Ocean's comments of groundwater, um, we do consider groundwater as, uh, a source of nitrogen to potentially to surface waters. Uh, the thing about groundwater is it's the medium of transport. It's not the actual source. It's just the, f the flow pathway. The source that primarily would be polluting groundwater in the lower river basin is irrigated agriculture. And our agricultural order does have groundwater protection requirements. So we're expecting that those um, regulatory requirements will reduce loading to groundwater and therefore reduce any risk of uh, transport to nearby surface waters. With regard to septic systems, there are some uh, communities in the middle part of the river basin that have um, a lot of septic systems. Um, we don't have any evidence or any data that shows that they are contributing uh, nitrate to surface waters. It's, you know, theoretically it's possible. We don't have any data. There are no identified impaired streams in the vicinity of where we do have um, a lot of septic systems. So we don't have the data to say that it is an impact to surface water. Um, but we do, I, we do acknowledge that it's definitely could be a risk to groundwater. And we, the water board has uh, separate regulatory tracks that are addressing uh, septic systems in the middle reaches of the river basin. So we anticipate that the risk to groundwater is being addressed through separate regulatory tracks. And uh, next slide, please. So finally, we're recommending that the board adopt the, uh, these TMDLs to approve an amendment to the Central Coast Basin Plan, which establishes nitrogen compound TMDLs and an associated implementation strategy addressing nitrogen loading in the river basin. And that's the conclusion, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate the good work on this. And, um, you know, I went to UC Santa Barbara, and so the watershed <laughs> um, is familiar to me in the area. And it was a nice opportunity here uh, on this project just to recall that space and just understand the, the impairments here on the lower uh, part of um, the river, certainly. And it does call the question if you do have impairments higher up, you know, there may be something there in the estuary, but I think I appreciate the good work that was done to keep that space open. And I think appropriately and importantly, it is about the data and there's a data project there for, sur for sure in the estuary. And, um, but I appreciate the, the work to conform to what I know was also recent upgrades uh, in the, the treatment uh, plant there at Lone Polk. So I don't have any questions off the bat. We do have one commenter, but I look to my fellow board colleagues for comment prior. Okay, let's go to our commenter. Uh, we have uh, here Winston Hurst, uh, potentially joining virtually, that is. Uh, yes, hi. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me just pull up my uh, prepared remarks. Um, so yes, the Santa Barbara Fly Fishers um, thank the Water Board for the thoughtful and detailed response to our written comments. And we again voice our support of these water quality measures as a whole. Um, in particular, we do appreciate the consideration of the sensitive downstream estuary habitat as expressed in the 20% safety margin incorporated into the total nitrogen TMDL. Um, and this safety margin puts the current numerical target for total nitrogen TMDL at eight milligrams per liter. And this sort of acts as a hedge for the lack of measurements in the estuary itself. Um, 
We do reiterate our stance that uh, the total nitrogen should be lowered to within the two to six milligram per liter range, which the US EPA has stated is, is uh, the acceptable range for waters to be protective against biostimulatory uh, stimulatory effects. And the, in the response we received on this point, it was indicated that these levels are non-regulatory and that the applicable regulation is the narrative water quality objective for biostimulatory substances. Um, and as this regulation doesn't prov provide a numeric target, uh, the staff opted to follow the 20% safety margin based on the peer-reviewed Lower Salinas Watershed uh, Nutrient TMDL completed in 2010. Uh, we do see some shortcomings in basing the current regulation on the prior one. Um, during a peer review of that TMDL, the 20% margin was uh, a point of some discussion um, with acknowledgement by, uh, by the staff that it might need further uh, study for to, to verify its efficacy. And there are also um, some important differences between that TMDL and the one currently under consideration. Um, so first, this the, the 2010 TMDL for the Lower Salinas River that we're sort of basing the the current uh, TMDL on, uh, it actually contains two TMDLs. There's one for a wet season uh, from November 1st through April 30th, and one for the dry season from May 1st to October 31st. So while the wet season does use the same 20% margin or eight milligrams per liter type regulation that we currently are, uh, that's currently there for the Santinez, um, it also has this dry season regulation that's actually much lower at 1.7 milligrams per liter. So overall, they're actually, um, if you look at sort of the average over the year, it's it's 5.5 milligram per liter. Um, and also this lower Salinas TMDL was set prior to revisions to the US EPA guidelines in 2013. So in, in consequence, we think that a TMDL in the two to six milligram uh, per liter range actually more closely aligns with the peer reviewed lower Salinas TMDL. And it would be based on more recent guidelines from the EPA. And of course it would still satisfy the narrative water quality objective for biostimulatory substances, which is the applicable regulation here. Alternatively, if uh, eight milligrams per liter is kept as a TMDL, then by analogy with the Salinas TMDL, um, perhaps this should only hurt hold during the wet season and a more stringent TMDL should be set for the dry season. Um, turning to the question of monitoring uh, the estuary for water quality, we are curious if there are any plans in the works um, by CCAMP or, or any other organization. Um, and also recognizing that we all have a part to play here, we would also like to know if uh, there's someone we could contact about possibly arranging assistance for that effort. Um, again, we thank the members of the board and the dedicated staff for all your time and commitment. Um, and again, we do want to reiterate that we strongly support the overall direction of this regulation. Thank you. Thank you as well, Mr. Hurst. I really appreciate uh, this great engagement. I appreciate your comments. Uh, certainly comes to mind, or you know, I know what's on deck amongst a number of things before the board is a biostimulatory you know, uh, policy here that I think at some point is definitely ripe for the sort of discussion and flagging that you have when it comes to some of the consistency in science across some of the regions. But I appreciate the support of this project. I think, again, it, it, it strikes the right balance here amongst us, but I uh, really appreciate the contribution to these discussions. And the um, when it comes to um, monitoring in the estuary, please do work with the regional board. But I know that you know through the Office of Information Management Analysis, we have the SWAMP program. Uh, there's a uh, Water Quality Monitoring Council as well. I think other places that um, hopefully, you know, it, it's not on any, uh, we don't have the resources on any one of us to be able to really accomplish the work. So always looking for partners uh, amongst it. So thank you again. Appreciate those comments, Mr. Hurst. Board Member McGuire. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Hurst. I appreciate the comments and um, your comparison to the Lower Salinas TMDL is very helpful and enlightening, and I agree, uh, biostimulatory substances is a priority area for the board and uh, at the state board level and, and as well as the regional boards. Um, so I was just kind of looking to uh, staff here, just wondering if you could comment a bit on that dynamic in terms of how this compared as you looked at the Lower Salinas TMDL and the wet, dry season differences and how maybe this was a bit unique or a different um, set of circumstances? The short answer is um, it is a little bit different circumstances and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, for it, Our approach at the Central Coast Water Board has been to, for our biostimulatory TMDLs, has been to adopt a weight of evidence approach. What that means is if we're going to um, recommend 
you know, very stringent nutrient targets or thresholds, we have to see evidence of a adverse water quality response in terms of algae, biomass, um, excessive, um, excessive nuisance blooms, dissolved oxygen problems. We, saw, we definitely saw all of that in the Salinas, lower Salinas Valley. San Inez, uh, because the water quality has really been improving in the past 10 years, we didn't, we didn't see, um, you know, really, we didn't have data to show excessive amounts of algae, excessive amounts of biomass, lots of nuisance blooms. We didn't have that data. We, don't, we didn't even see evidence of low dissolved oxygen. Now that's for the river. What's happening in the estuary, we don't know. I think what we try to address in our comments is if we have data for the estuary and you know, we, we see evidence of nutrient enrichment, algal blooms, a, uh, an adverse water quality response to all that nutrient loading, we can revisit this TMDL, reopen it, and develop more stringent nitrogen thresholds. In terms of the question of water quality data, um, we did, in our, in our, in our, in our staff co response to comments, we did note that um, there, there, is, there could be grant funding to develop an, a, a monitoring program for the estuary. Sea Camp can be uh, coordinate with um, the Santa Barbara Fly Fishers or any other groups. And um, we always do accept data from third parties to, um, to, um, in, our, in our assessment programs. So there's kind of three steps, grant funding, third party data, or some kind of more coordination with our Sea Camp and the, these non-government organizations. Thank you, I really appreciate that response. And just wanna flag that certainly there's data needs out there. And I'm thinking to the red tide experience, particularly in the San Francisco Bay estuary. And I'm, I'm sure no estuary, frankly, is immune from the effects of climate change and bioaccumulation and those types of risk factors. And sometimes with the lack of data, it's hard to know where the risk factors are higher or lower. So I would definitely be supportive of some sort of effort to better inform our understanding of the estuary and the risks that might, might be present there. So thank you for that. But otherwise, I'm uh, comfortable with the uh, proposed TMDL. Really appreciate that, board member. Looking to other colleagues, if they had question or comment. OK, hearing none, I think we may be prepared. OK. I am not prepared. I will move to adopt item six. I'll second. Thank you both. Ms. Tyler, can you please call a roll call vote? Board Member McGuire? Aye. Board Member Morgan? Aye. Board Member Firestone? Aye. Vice Chair Diodamo? Aye. And Chair Esquivel? Aye. Thank you. Thank you as well. Voters unanimous, carries, and the item is adopted. Really appreciate the good work again and look forward to what is, I know, additional discussion around amongst all these issues. So thank you. Next, uh, we can move on uh, to item number seven which we're doing a tour of the state and now we're moving to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board for now a consideration of proposed resolution approving an amendment to the water quality control plan for the Los Angeles region. Give a moment for us to transition. I believe our colleagues are joining us virtually here. Anyone Are folks able to unmute themselves here? They may not be able to, they may be, oh, they're all co-hosts. No? Okay. Hi, we seem to be jumping around with uh, computers. Can you hear me? We can. It sounds like there may be an echo, though. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, we're good. We are. Thank you. Can you hear us now? We can. We can hear you. Thank you. There's no sound coming up my computer. 
Can you hear me? Uh, uh, Ms. Gallon, uh, you may Sounds not be like able to hear, hear us. Me. Am I not on mute? Can you hear me? Apologies, folks. We're, I think we're having some te technical difficulties with those in Los Angeles. They may not oh, be able to hear us. hear us. Okay. But we can't hear you. <laughs> Good morning, members of the board. My name is Celine Galan. I am the uh, supervisor of one of the TMDL, un TMDL units here at the Los Angeles Water Board. And joining me today are Dr. Elby Nye, the manager of our regional program section, and Tano Nguyen, I hope I did this right, uh, the water resources control engineer in charge of this project. So the item before you today is a reconsideration of the Dominus Channel and Greater Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbors waters, toxic pollutant TMDL. This TMDL has been in effect since 2012. Next slide, please. The TMDL addresses over 70 separate impairments due to heavy metal and organic pollutants in the Dominicus Channel and Greater Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor waters. It was originally adopted by the Los Angeles Regional Board in 2011 and by the State Board in 2012. The TMDL revisions before you today mostly incorporate the updated statewide sediment quality provisions or SQPs as amended by the State Water Board in 2018 for both the sediment quality objective or SQ for the protection of petty communities and the sediment quality objective for the protection of human health. The updated SQOs are incorporated into the options for demonstrating compliance with the TMDL's waste load allocations and load allocations. The TMDL also adjusts the implementation schedule for achieving the SQ for protection of human health in light of the new compliance alternative. The TMDL revisions also consider the results of special studies and modeling as directed by the State Water Board. It includes additional source assessment and implementation re recommendations for PCBs and updates monitoring requirements. The TMDL revision was adopted by the Los Angeles Water Board on October 13, 2022. For the State Board consideration, the revision was noticed for public comment on September 13, 2023. We received eight comment letters on the item and comment and draft response to comments were posted on the State Water Board website. Now I have a pre brief presentation if you wish, otherwise we're available for questions. And if you can respond in the chat, because I still can't hear you. I think you should go ahead and you proceed with your presentation. I know there are a couple of uh, commenters today, so I think that might be best. Okay, sounds good. All right. So first, uh, I'm going to review briefly the water bodies that are part of the TMDL. Those include the Domingos Channel and the harbor waters of the port of Long Beach and Los Angeles and San Pedro Bay. The Domingos Channel contains a freshwater section, including the Torrance Lateral and the Domingos Channel Estuary. As I mentioned before, the TMDL includes over 70 separate impairments due to heavy metals and organic pollutants, almost all in fish or in sediments. There are a few impairments in the water column by metals in the Dominguez channel, but mostly it's fish and sediments. So this is largely a DDT, PCB, fish tissue, and sediment TMDL. The TMDL set forth a program of implementation to restore these impaired waters that is based on the California Toxic Rule, the Los Angeles Water Board's Basin Plan, and of more relevance to today's presentation, the 2009 statewide sediment quality provisions for toxic pollutants in California's bays and estuaries. In particular, the TMDL incorporated the sediment quality provisions narrative target for the protection of Bantic community, and compliance from metals and PAHs can be demonstrated by the sediment meeting the Bantic community sediment quality provisions. Next slide, please. The sediment quality provisions that were adopted by the State Water Board in 2009 included a narrative sediment quality objective for the, for the protection of Bantic community in sediments, which included implementation provisions. They also included a narrative sediment quality objective for the protection of human health from exposure of contaminants from contamination of fish, from consumption of fish, sorry. However, 
The objective for the protection of human health did not at that time include implementation provisions. So when the State Board approved the TMDL in 2012, they also directed the State Board staff to develop the assessment methodology to support implementation of the SQO to protect human health. State Board staff, as directed, set up a sediment quality objective advisory committee made up of stakeholders throughout the state and relying on the capabilities and expertise of the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project of SWERP and also worked with Los Angeles Water Board staff to form a local collaboration, the Harbor Technical Working Group, with significant in involvement of staff from the Los Angeles Water Board, the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and other Los Angeles region local stakeholders. The Harbor Technical Working Group, with resources from State Board and significant resources from the ports, developed site-specific data and an analysis, an analysis of the greater harbor waters as a test case for the application implement, and implementation of the SQO for human health protection. This test case was used to re revise the sediment quality provisions. The, set, the State Water Board amended the sediment quality provisions on June 5, 2018, adding an assessment methodology for the SQO to protect human health. The main purpose of the revision to the TMDL is to incorporate the updated sediment quality provisions, including the assessment methodologies for the protection of human health, into the options for demonstrating compliance with the TMDL allocations, and to adjust the implementation schedule for achieving the sediment quality objectives for protection of human health. Next slide, please. So here, this is a general overview of the TMDL structure with today's proposed revisions showed in red and underlines. As you can see, the numeric targets are used to set numeric allocations in water and sediments. In addition to these numeric targets, a narrative target was originally incorporated for the protection of Benti community using the sediment quality provisions. The human health sediment quality provisions are now incorporated as well as sediment targets. In water, compliance with the TMDL can be demonstrated by meeting the water, the water allocations. The assessment of compliance in sediment is more complex. Compliance for metals and pHs in sediment can be demonstrated by meeting the sediment target or allocation, or by the sediment meeting the Benti community sediment quality provisions. For bioaccumulative compounds, so those compounds that may ultimately impact human health, that, that is DDT, PCB, chlorine, and dioxin, Compliance could originally be demonstrated by either meeting the numeric fish contaminant goal, meeting the numeric sediment target, or meeting the sediment allocation. Now, a fourth compliance option is, is available by meeting the human health sediment quality provisions. Next slide, please. So the revisions to the TMDL include the principal revision, which we just discussed, which is the incorporation of the human health sediment quality provisions into the compliance options for the waste load allocation and load allocations and the implementation sections of the TMDL. There is also additional strengthening of two elements of the TMDL. There is an additional source assessment for PCBs and potential actions to reduce PCB loadings for MS4 permittees and also an additional fish and sediment linkage analysis for greater harbor waters. We also included revisions to monitor requirements to update those requirements, revisions to the implementation schedule, and other minor revisions to cor correct errors or for clarification. Next slide, please. So I did want to highlight the schedule addition before I move on to comments. Task 3B, was added to support site-specific human health assessment for the greater harbor waters. Task 5B was added to ensure contaminated sediment, contaminated sediment management plans, or CSMPs, shall be revised and submitted to the regional board to include milestones with specific plans and associated completion dates for remediating identified hotspots. The compliance TMDL deadline to meet conditions to protect the Benti community remains unchanged. So those have to be met by 2032 still. In addition to this, a compliance deadline to meet conditions protecting human health was incorporated into the proposed TMDL implementation schedule. The deadline proposed by regional board staff in the tentative TMDL revision was originally March 2040, 
and it was changed to March 2037 when the TMDL revision was adopted at the original board hearing. This time frame is based on a, on a model estimating the time needed to attain fish tissue targets based on 100% watershed load reduction and removal of contamination hotspots. We are considering this timeline achievable and appropriate. Next slide, please. The revised TMDL was publicly noticed by the state for the State Water Board hearing on September 13, 2023, for a 45 days public comment period. A total of eight letters were received, and you can see on the screen um, the people who sent letters. The majority of comments received are similar to the comments that were received for the Los Angeles Water Board hearing. Next slide, please. The City of Los Angeles Harbor Department and the Port of Long Beach support the State Board approval of the Basin Plan Amendment to incorporate the sediment quality provisions into the TMDL and to include Human Health SQ as an alternative compliance method. They both requested further clarity and consistency on how the TMDL should be incorporated into permits, especially regarding the use of sediment quality provisions as an alternative means of water quality compliance. They particularly pointed out the pending industrial general permit and the pending commercial industrial and institutional permit. No additional changes to the TNDL are needed to clarify when the sediment quality provisions may be used as compliance alternatives because the TMDL already specifies when compliance with assigned allocations may be demonstrated using the procedures in the sediment quality provisions for various discharges assigned waste load allocations. Federal regulations require NPDES, NPDES permits to be consistent with the assumptions and requirements of any available waste load allocation for the discharge. NPDES permit writers at the state and regional water boards review the language in all relevant and applicable TMDLs prior to adopting or reissuing re NPDES permits. Comments on implementation of the TMDL in specific permits are more appropriately made through the permit adoption process for that permit. Next slide, please. The County of Los Angeles and the, the City of Los Angeles Bureau of Sanitation raised the same concern as they did during the regional board hearing about the continued absence of monitoring and implementation actions required for private entities, including industrial sites, construction activities, and historical manufacturers of DDT and PCBs as responsible parties to the TMDL. The TMDL amendment did not consider changes or revisions to the responsible parties identified in the Harbor's Toxics TMDL. Nevertheless, the TMDL does not omit requirements for private entities to participate in the implementation and monitoring actions stemming from the TMDL. Given the large number of private entities that discharge to the waters addressed in the Harbor's Toxics TMDL, the TMDLA TA assigns waste allocations applicable to private entities as a class such as general construction and general industrial discharge and other NPDES dischargers. These waste load allocations apply to private entities, such as industrial facilities and construction sites, and future NPDES permits that discharge to waters covered by the TMDL. Dischargers enrolled in NPDES permit that implement the waste load allocation in the Harbor Toxics TMDL are responsible for demonstrating that discharges from their facility do not cause or co contribute to exceedances of water quality standards addressed by the TMDL. In addition, the TMDL implementation schedule required responsible parties, including all Dominguez Channel responsible parties, Greater Harbors responsible parties, and Consolidated State responsible parties, to submit an implementation plan and contaminated sediment management plan to implement the TMDL and remediate hotspots within two years of the effective date of the TMDL. These tasks apply to private entities and non-MS4 permittees, as well as the cities. Next slide, please. So in summary, staff reviewed and reconsidered the TMDL elements and consulted with stakeholders before proposing the TMDL revisions before you. A lot of progress has been made by, by the Harbor Technical Working Group, including State Water Board, Los Angeles Regional Water Board, SCORP, and other stakeholders. To build on the progress, we recommend that the board adopt the revisions to the TMDL as proposed by staff, which include incorporation of sediment quality provisions as the options for demonstrating compliance with the waste load allocations and load allocations, and to adjust the implementation schedule 
for achieving the SQO for protection of human health. So staff recommend that you approve the revisions, revisions to Los, the Los Angeles Region Basin Plan. And this concludes my presentation. I'm available for, for questions if you like. Thank you. We well, appreciate that and importantly appreciate the good work that's gone on to uh, this update. Um, I, I sometimes bring up the Dominguez Channel just as an example of, especially in an era when you know, raw sewage was the main issue truly in, within the, the channel, how far we've come along um, and just appreciate the, the good work that continues to be done here by the regional board. Um, looking to fellow board colleagues, we do have a couple of commenters to hear from, but if there's anything off the bat, and not seeing any, uh, we can start with uh, Annalisa Mo, be followed by Glenn Cow, and then Ray to here. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Great. Thank you so much. And good morning. Um, uh, hello, Chair Escobar and members of the board. For the record, my name is Annalisa Mo, and I serve as the Associate Director of Science and Policy at Heal the Bay, where we are dedicated to making the coastal waters and watersheds of greater LA safe healthy and clean uh, because we believe that everybody deserves access to, to clean water and edible fish um, and a healthy environment in which to live and thrive. Um, I do want to start by thanking the, the regional board and uh, the regional board staff members for um, their engagement with us uh, through the process of developing uh, this uh, updated TMDL um, and also for keeping the timeline to achieve the human health uh, SQOs as, as short as possible. Um, I mean, the, the TMDL uh, is not perfect in our view. There, there could be more on the margin of safety and, and there uh, could be inclusion of proactive monitoring in the Dominguez Channel and Harbor Waters uh, for constituents of emerging concern um, so that we can prevent catastrophes like this from occurring in the future. But we recognize that this TMDL update is good um, and it will be protective of, of human health. So we do support adoption. Um, our main concern lies with implementation. Uh, stormwater capture projects have definitely gained momentum in LA with the Safe Clean Water Program, but permittees are still pushing back on the 2032 deadline to address stormwater pollution con uh, contributions. And the uh, 2027 uh, sediment cleanup deadline is rapidly approaching. And the problem here is that every single day when no progress is made is one more day that subsistence anglers face toxicity exposure for themselves and for their families. Um, now, Heal the Bay goes out weekly to talk to anglers through our angler outreach program, and we are very proud of the work that we do th uh, with the Fish Contamination Education Collaborative. But it's also disheartening to educate community members on the risk that they face year after year, decade after decade, and not be able to share good news on progress made to reduce the source of that risk that they face. Um, so I just urge the regional board and the state board to do everything possible to ensure that progress is made uh, so that the deadlines within this TMDL are met. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mo. Next, I'd like to call up Glenn Cow. Uh, hello, uh, if you can hear me, I hope you do. We can, good morning. Good morning, sir, how are you? Um, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, all the uh, board staff there for the opportunity. Thank you for allowing the city of Noah to provide comments on the basin plan amendment to include the Dominguez Channel Harbor Toxics TMDL. The amendment would require MS per, MS4 permittees in the San Gabriel River to contribute to the cleanup of toxics in the Los Angeles and Long Beach harbors and at no small cost. As I and others have explained to regional board staff on several occasions, San Gabriel Valley cities in the upper and lower San Gabriel River do not drain to any portion of the Long Beach Harbor. The nearest is to the San Gabriel River. Runoff from permittees in the upper San Gabriel River drain to Whittier Narrow spreading ground. Runoff would not reach Long Beach, Harbor, Long Beach Harbor. Cities in the lower San Gabriel River, which includes Norwalk, drain to Seal Beach in Orange County, some eight miles east of the Long Beach Harbor. Furthermore, runoff contaminated sediment would be contained in Los Alamos Bay, which as the map below shows is semi-enclosed. Semi That'll be the next slide, or, or it'll be a slide coming up. Norwalk and others are concerned with having to comply with Dominguez Channel, Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbor's toxic TMZL based on plan amendment. The amendment would require the MS4 permittees in the San Gabriel River to contribute participate in the cleanup of toxics in Los Angeles and Long Beach harbors at no small cost, as I previously mentioned. 
as I and others have, have, have explained to regional board staff on several occasions, San Gabriel Valley cities in the upper and lower San Gabriel River do not drain to any portion of the Long Beach Harbor, which is close to San Gabriel River. Seems like I just said all this. Can we go to the next slide, please? I believe I just said this. I'm sorry, thank you. That's that's the map I was referring to, was speaking of earlier, that shows where the outfall for San Gabriel River is down just below the, San, the Alamitos Bay and in that vicinity there. Uh, next slide, please. Clearly, runoff from San Gabriel River, which supposedly contains contaminated sediment, would not reach Long Beach Harbor. As Norwalk, as Norwalk and others have mentioned previously, the primary source of contamination to the harbors is due to the historical dumping of the DDT and other pesticides by chemical companies. Uh, next and final slide, please. Lastly, as Norwalk and other permittees have mentioned on several occasions, the MS4 permittees, both city and county, are not responsible parties. Our understanding is that only the US EPA can make determination of a, of a responsible party, which as it has not done so with respect to permittees. Therefore, we respectfully ask that the state board return the Harbor Toxics TMDL to the regional board for correction. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide comment. Thank you, Mr. Cow. I appreciate those comments. Uh, next, we'd like to call up Ray to here. <clears throat> Mr. Tahir, it seems you are unmuted, but we can't uh, hear you. If you don't uh, mind going on to your Zoom platform and uh, where the microphone icon is, there's a small carrot. You should be able to choose um, a different input or uh, an input that may be working well. Again, you're unmuted. It's just your microphone input isn't, isn't giving us audio. No, still can't hear you, unfortunately, sir. Um, try selecting one of the other microphones if there's other options there. Um, again, if you look on the Zoom platform, uh, down on the lower kind of middle screen, wherever you see the, the uh, microphone icon, it's the, it looks like it's the mute button as well. There's a small carrot next to it. And we'll ask you to unmute again here in a moment. But again, if, there, if you click that small carrot, you should be able to select uh, a different microphone input. And we'll invite you to unmute again here. It looks like you got muted. Yeah, unfortunately, Mr. Tahiris, we're still not getting audio from you. Um, alternatively, I believe we can have you call in. Yes, Mr. Tahir, the, assuming you can hear us, the email you received from the clerk of the board included a phone number and passcode. If you have a phone handy, you could dial in on that and we'll combine your audio up with your video feed. Mr. Tahir, I don't know if you're able to hear us. Um, hopefully you're able to potentially call in again. There's uh, phone instructions or on the email you should have received from the clerk of the board. 
If you'd like, you can try again selecting another microphone potentially, but unfortunately, we're still not getting your audio. No, we still still aren't able to hear you, Mr. Tahir. Uh, nope, still unable to hear you. And again, uh, I think your best bet is to try to call in at this point or uh, again, try to select a different audio input, microphone input on the Zoom platform. And you can do that if you see the small icon that looks like a, a microphone, there's a small carrot next to it. If you click on that, you should be able to see other options. Yeah, I think what you did was you clicked on the actual mute button and okay, so you're unmuted again here. And again, um, to the right of it, it looks like a small little up arrow. If you select that next to the microphone, you should be able to potentially select another input that allows us to hear you. Okay, how about now? We can hear you now, Mr. Tahir. I apologize. For oh, it's okay. That. No, no worry in the least. I'm oh, glad we're able to get your... IFT compromise. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ray Tehir, and I'm with Texas Environmental, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the Gardena Valley Democratic Club. Uh, could you advance the next slide, please? Um, in our comments to the Regional Board, we ask the State Board to return the matter to the Regional Board for the following reasons. Uh, to begin with, it requires responsible parties, which include 70 MS4 permittees, LA cities and county, to participate in the remediation of toxics in the Los Angeles and Long Beach harbors. However, as mentioned to the regional board on several occasions, MS4 permittees and others cannot be deemed responsible parties because they have not been designated so by US EPA. As mentioned, only US EPA has a legal authority to designate a responsible party under CERCLA, which applies to Superfund sites. The harbors are not Superfund sites, and US EPA has not designated any MS4 permittee as a responsible party. Therefore, this requirement, just based on this alone, should be voided and returned to the regional board for removal. It should also be noted the MS4 permit adopted in 2021, some nine years after the adoption of the Harbor Tax TN bill in 2012, there is no mention of responsible parties relative to the Harbor Toxics TMDL. The MS4 permit only uses the term responsible permittee, but without any connection to any of the Harbor Toxics TMDL requirements. And according to the reconsidered Harbor Tox uh, Toxics TMDL adopted by the Regional Board in 2022, responsible parties are required to submit to the board a contaminated management plan by March of 2014. Even this requirement is obviously defective because one, TMDLs are not self-executed. They are not standalone requirements. And two, the date for compliance has come and gone without a peep from the regional board. Next slide, please. Harbor toxics TMDLs, such as the ones just mentioned by board staff, uh, which includes heavy metals and pesticides, um, excuse me must be addressed, presumably in MPDS permits. Noah Walk and Rosemead pointed out that these TMDLs had been removed from the state's 303D list. In response, the Water Board said that TMDLs are not placed on or removed from the 303D list and do not affect established TMDLs. This is incorrect because it contradicts the state board's 303D listing policy, your state board policy, which was approved by US EPA. This reveals the staff, along with legal counsels, in need of training on this map. Further, here are some simple facts. A water quality objective that is exceeded to a limit specified in the listing policy, based on water quality data, is placed on the 303 DTM DLS because it has caused a beneficial use impairment. The data shows that exceedance are not sufficient to place or maintain an existing TMDL, 
then it is delisted. However, board staff argues, defensively on that act, that US EPA has given it that authority to continue a TMDL even if it is delisted. This is false. First of all, staff has now cited US EPA's alleged authority. Second, it has ignored the fact that US EPA routinely approves delisted and listed TMDLs that were recommended by the regional board and approved by the state board. Next slide, please. Cost is also a serious concern. As mentioned before, the 2012 Harbor Toxic TMDL estimates the cost to remediate the harbors of toxics to be about 600 million over a 20 year period, or 30,000, sorry, or 30 million per year per permittee. Uh, divided by 70 so called responsible parties, actually MS4 permittees, this comes to about an average of 429 thousand per year for each permittee. In terms of current dollars, the cost rises to 571,000 per year for each MS4 permittee. Against the, oh, one other thing, I should mention that according to the MS4 permit, permittees are not required to comply with any TMDL in the receiving order, and that includes settlements. Uh, compliance is supposed to determine and outfill discharges before it hits the receiving order. And beyond this, there is no current technology available that can measure sediment discharges from an outfall to receiving water. Therefore, against this background, the state board is urged to return the Harbor Toxic Scam Bill to the regional board for correction. And I thank you very much for your time and your patience. Thank you for your engagement and time as well, Mr. Tahir, and, and glad to, to be able to work through, through technical issues always. So thank you for, for the provision of, of your comments here. I think there are a few things that we may have some disagreement with, but I don't know if we're gonna go through everything, but I did wanna provide an opportunity for either uh, the regional board staff or our folks to comment or reflect on anything they heard from our two commenters. But again, no, I know there's might be, a, there was a lot that was presented and a lot that would actually be up for discussion. So I'll leave it to the discretion of the regional board staff and our folks here, if they'd like to uh, respond to anything they heard. Um, I will say, this is uh, LB Nye with the, the Los Angeles Regional Board. Um, <clears throat> uh, both uh, Mr. Kells and Mr. Chahir's uh, comments that they made uh, just now were also made in comment letters, so we have a complete response in our response to comments both in the from the uh, LA uh, Water Board, when the LA Water Board adopted the, the revision to the TMDL and in the response to comments that we prepared um, for this action, potential action, um, what I will I will point out just you know so it's clear to everybody listening that the this TMDL includes San Pedro Bay as an addressed water body by the the TMDL so that the cities that discharge to the San Gabriel River the San Gabriel River discharges directly into San into um, uh, San Pedro Bay so um, uh, uh, it's certainly appropriate that um, uh, those cities are are um, uh, part of the uh, the TMDL. And we did, when we did the TMDL, we made a kind of a simplifying assumption that the um, the TMDLs that were already in existence in the San Gabriel River and for the LA River above the estuary uh, would compel the kinds of actions that would be necessary to comply with this TMDL. So there are no waste load allocations or load allocations for the cities that discharge directly to the San Gabriel River, such as uh, Norwalk. <clears throat> But they are required by the TMDL to participate in monitoring because we, we do need to know, um, particularly DDT and PCB coming from those from those rivers. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add just to, for uh, the record there, Celine? Uh, I think the thing we could add to regarding the um, historical sources of um, uh, contamination. I think the picture that was shown in the in the presentation from by Mr. Kao uh, refers to an offshore dumping site. So that's not within the you know the the purview of the TMDL. However, I want to point out that the TMDL does take into account historical sources of contamination uh, just by essence. For example, the sediment quality objectives are taking into account sediment linkage, which means that it's taking into account fishes um, traveling outside of the harbor and coming back and how much of the contamination in the fish is actually linked to the sediment in place within the, um, the waters addressed by the TMDL. 
and uh, we also have we are participating uh, regarding the offshore dumping site. We are participating uh, in a collaborative efforts with the US EPA to address those um, those contamination. And, and the issues uh, that Mr. Tierher brought up about the 303D list and the responsible parties and how different agencies use those terms differently. Um, you know, these these are um, um, subject to which we've discussed with Mr. Tierher uh, a number of times. We do we do differ with him. Um, uh, we, we use the term responsible party in the TMDL in one way. EPA uses the term potential responsible parties under CERCLA, the Superfund Act, in a, in a slightly different way. But that doesn't mean we can't have responsible parties under our TMDL. Um, and the 303D list, uh, the question of um, if something is delisted, does the TMDL then kind of just go away? Uh, certainly, we disagree with Mr. Tier on that. The TMDL, the TMDL is a TMDL until the regional board and the state board um, take action to revise it or to um, uh, remove it. Thank you both. I appreciate those responses and clarifications to the comments we just heard. And yes, uh, uh, the regional board certainly heard them as well, I know, in the, in the adoption of the amendment um, prior. So thank you. Looking to fellow board colleagues if they have question or comment further, and if not, we may be prepared for a motion. I'll move to adopt. I'll second. Thank you both. Ms. Tyler, can you please call the roll call vote? Board Member Firestone? Aye. Board Member McGuire? I'm sorry, Board Member Morgan? Aye. Board Member McGuire? Aye. Vice Chair Diodamo? Aye. Chair. Aye. Thank you as well. Vote carries. And the item is adopted. Appreciate, again, the good work that's gone into this and look forward to what's going to be continued discussion. All right, well, that actually wraps up our items mm -hmm. here and brings us to our informational items, that are voting items, and brings us to our, our last tranche of informational items, which are board member reports and the executive uh, director's report. Do we have any board member reports? I know, I'll just start for myself. Been just focused on booting up here in the new year, and so haven't had any uh, real public engagement, but looking to other board colleagues if in case they have any reports. Um, I just have one last Friday, um, the 12th. I joined CUA for their um, biannual workshop. It was a great discussion just around um, a lot of the water board priorities, just including um, you know, aging infrastructure. I spoke just about this year being the 50th anniversary of the Safe um, Drinking Water Act and um, just support, so, inf aging infrastructure, affordability, and just, you know, what we see coming forward um, in this in these upcoming years, which is um, what climate change and the, um, the opportunities to continue the great work that's um, already been occurring over this past 50 years, but just how much more work is yet to, um, that, that is needed, and just um, the continued investments in our our, our communities and our drinking water systems. Really great. Thank you for being there and representing uh, the boards and appreciate CUA continuing to help gather, uh, especially the large urban water agencies uh, with us to, to think through a lot of those issues. So thank you, board member. Other colleagues with reports? Um, no report for me this time. Thank you. Okay, seeing none. Thank you. That wraps up item number eight and brings us to our first executive director's report with our new executive director, Eric Oppenheimer. Sorry for flubbing the title at the start. You'd think I would have hit it right on, on at the first, but good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I don't have anything specific to flag in this report, but we can take any questions if you have any. I would just request that um, in a future report, if we can get an update on the arrearages program and how that's going, because I know, um, I think there's been some good news and uptick in the applications. I think that would be great. So look forward to that in the future. And we will give you an exact update, but um, the uh, dollar amount is higher than our last two combined. The number of applications is much lower. Mm, interesting. So we have fewer folks applying, but applying for more money. 
right? And it's upwards of 400 million, but I don't have the exact number. I get an update tomorrow morning at eight. If you <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you. And that application period's closed, right? I think. So the application period closed at uh, in December 31st. We have a, um, we are continuing to finalize applications up through the end of this uh, month. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's still time. The, the, I think that yeah we did we we technically said we closed the application period at the the end of December, but we've been accepting and pushing folks to come that in the door. Sense. So it's pretty close to the end. But if you, if you're listening and you've just realized that you have millions of dollars <laughs> worth of debt that you need to help come your in. people, call us. Yes, yes, truly, actually, and thank you, board member, for highlighting that. All right, well, that wraps up executive director's report and wraps up our first meeting here of the new year. I uh, just appreciate everyone. Our next board meeting will be February 6th, uh, until, and that's in three weeks. So uh, we'll see you all in three weeks. Until then, this meeting is adjourned, and thank you all. Look forward to seeing you soon.